everyone in Iran, good morning in Italy or in the US, if you are joining us from there. It's my pleasure to introduce today the speaker, Dr. Matthew Diamond from CISA. Dr. Diamond earned his Bachelor in Engineering from the University of Virginia in 84 and then pursued a PhD in Neurobiology at uh, North Carolina in 89. Uh, he did a postdoc at Brown University with Dr. Ebner. And after that, he got a position at Vanderbilt University in the U.S. And shortly after that, he moved to CISA, to Trieste at CISA in Italy, which he's been there since. Um, many, of us knows, many of us know his work. We read it in textbooks that he wrote, From Neuron to Brain. And also, he's worked on most of our friends that uh, when neuroscience passed through his lab and his early trainees. Uh, Dr. Daimler uses the research system as a, as a model to answer important questions like rate coding versus spike time encoding, uh, neural coding in general, uh, key integration, working memory, and decision making. Uh, Dr. Daimler is also very active in educating, in teaching neuroscience and educating young people. I had the privilege to, one of, to be in one of his courses in 2004 which also changed my career and my path in neuroscience. But Diamond is a very dear friend of IPM and is helping us through many, many ways. Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce him and to uh, ask you to join me in welcoming Dr. Diamond basically back to IPM. Dr. Diamond, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. That's very kind and it's, I feel like I'm tearing up and uh, with emotion so it's very hard to continue a scientific lecture after this uh, very very warm welcome in fact i want to begin with that the same point that you made which is my long and deep friendship with with ipm this was the workshop in 2004 my one of my first phd students was uh, ezan arabzade who you see in this photograph i don't know if you see my mouse moving but uh, with my cursor, I'm pointing to ASAN. Here's Here I'm standing behind ASAN. This is in the garden of IPM in 2004. Here I am with uh, Jose Mestecki, and, and here were my classes. So I, I really, really loved that, that visit and have a um, very long and, and good relationship with IPM. Uh, we've hosted many students, and I'm really looking forward to the time when I can uh, make another visit. And we also have a relationship with Sharif University at CISA. This is uh, 2015. Here I am with some visitors at CISA, some visitors from Sharif University, where uh, we signed a memorandum, memorandum of understanding, which strengthens bonds between the two universities and launches a series of actions aimed at, at intensifying their scientific collaboration. And I think that the very... Um, uh, solid presence of, of CISA and students at this at this current meeting is is part of the relationship with uh, Sharif University. So um, now we can begin talking a bit about the scientific questions at hand, and I'm sort of mixing a little bit of uh, teaching, and make uh, considering this a classroom as well as a as a lecture room, and so so I want to give some notion of of how we go about doing research, and we're very much inspired by uh, one place that I visited uh, during my trip to Iran, um, in, in Persepolis. Um, this is not Persepolis, but is uh, another ancient site. And the problem that um, people had in modern times is that the scripts in which the um, text for the monuments was written were not understood. Uh, finally, in the 1800s, it was solved, and it was solved by because the scripts were the text was written in three different languages. One of them, old ancient Persian, was known. Two others were not known, but by correlations between them, uh, between what is known and what is not known, the unknown language can be understood. 
And that's kind of the inspiration for how we, we try to go about uh, cognitive neuroscience of perception memory. And we consider, we try to build into every experiment three different things. And as these, um, as these scripts are running in parallel, so are these three different things running in parallel in time. Uh, quantified sensory input, uh, perceptual action, uh, behavior, and neuronal activity. And there are methods for measuring the relationships between these, the correlations between them. Psychophysics measures the relationship between a quantified sensory input and a percept. Sensory coding measures the relationship between the quantified sensory input and neuronal activity in the sensory representation. And then the conversion of a sensory representation into a percept and behavior involves decoding and decision making. So there, there are methods for approaching all of these, and we try to do so in as much as possible in rats and also in humans. So um, in, the, in the time of the first visit to IPM, we were very much interested in, in texture. And then a more recent interest is in how rats and how people feel vibrations. What do you really understand about the world uh, from um, uh, extracting information from a vibration? And what we imagined as we began the experiment is a scenario like this in which a, a little rodent, this fellow, is in his uh, home nest and he's thinking about coming out to scavenge for food. But perhaps before going out, he uh, feels the ground for vibrations which might inform him as to whether there's a, a very large predator outside which might produce vibrations as it moves around outside the nest. And, and such vibrations would warn the animal not, not to come out. So this was uh, drawn by uh, a technician at CISA uh, based on sort of how I wanted him to depict this. And we have, there's no, very little known about the natural life of rodents, so we don't know if this actually happens, but it turns out that one, one line of research has found something that's not too distant from that. It happens in kangaroo rats who send a scout out of the nest, and he, the scout looks around and then sends information back into the colony by thumping on the ground, producing vibration through his uh, hind paw, uh, and these presumably are picked up uh, as, as vibrations not too differently from what we imagined as we began the experiments. So this was the kind of, this is uh, perhaps a more urban city-like uh, um, depiction of the same phenomenon. Uh, I imagine that rats in their natural environment, which is subway tracks and things like that, uh, can feel the arrival of the train by vibrations which they uh, probably pick up through their uh, paws and their whiskers. So this is the kind of thing that we wanted to bring into the laboratory and we began some 10 years ago uh, and uh, produced the first publication in 2014 in PNAS. And the person who began these experiments was um, Arash Fasihi, uh, joined a few years later by Athena Akrami. So you can already begin to see a very um, uh, very Iranian um, flavor to the research line. So when we bring this into the laboratory, the rat uh, learns to place its whiskers on a plate, which is controlled by a motor. The plate produces vibrations. The rats perform uh, analyses of the vibrations, perceptual analyses, which I'll talk about later. And based on the information that the, the rat acquires through its whiskers about the vibration, he, he has to make a choice uh, as to whether to go, go to the left spout or the right spout. If he goes to the correct spout, and correct is determined by the properties of the stimulus, if he goes to the correct one, he gets a reward. If he goes to the incorrect one, he gets no reward and has to start another trial in order to, to have another chance. So this is what a trial looks like. The rat is in the um, nose poke and uh, receives vibrations. He gets a go cue, withdraws, turns to the reward spout, and gets a reward. Now we do the same experiment in humans where the vibration comes through the fingertip and we do the analysis of the data in the exact same way. And as you'll see, this, this approach of the rats and humans in parallel has allowed us to see that many of the 
functional principles that characterize perception and memory in rats are in common to humans. So it allows us to, to verify that, that what we're seeing in the rats is, are actually uh, quite deep uh, general principles which um, govern the way that we experience the world as well as humans. So this is uh, again Arash Fasili um, who uh, uh, made a, produced a number of publications with me and we continue to work uh, at a distance. Uh, he's now in Department of Physics at University of California San Diego in the research group of David Kleinfeld. So this was the experiment that um, Arash uh, designed. Uh, the, the stimulus is a vibration which is shown here in the dimension of speed. Uh, it's actually the stimulus is moving, the plate is moving backwards and forwards. So the actual physical dimension would be velocity because there are two directions of movement, but we take the absolute value generally and refer to it as speed. So zero is the minimum value. And the vibration is characterized by the mean value the, uh, of speed and by its duration. So this is the first stimulus. We have uh, T1 and speed 1 uh, uh, for the first stimulus. There's a delay. The second stimulus is presented and it's characterized by speed 2 and by T2, duration 2. Now if the rat is or human is uh, trained to do the intensity task, the measurement that has to be made is which intensity, which speed is greater, speed 1 or speed 2. And your visual system, I can't give you touch through this lecture, but your visual system tells you that speed 1 is in fact greater than speed 2. So that should be the correct choice on this particular trial. Now note that the other feature is duration, which in the intensity task is not the feature that should be extracted. It should, in, in a sense, be ignored. It's irrelevant. Now, we can characterize the difficulty of any given comparison by the normalized speed difference, which is speed 2 minus speed 1 divided by speed 1 plus speed 2. It's the difference normalized by the mean size of the two vibrations, basically. And this case is a negative value because speed 1, as you see, is lower than speed 2. So negative values of the speed difference mean that the second vibration is weaker and positive values mean that the second vibration is stronger. And that's exactly the test. The perceptual system uh, essentially has to say, is this speed difference positive or negative? And that determines the choice that has to be made. Now we sometimes change term terminology from one paper to another. And uh, in some figures you'll see this called the normalized intensity difference. A normalized, sometimes we call it speed, sometimes intensity, depending on what the reviewers of the manuscript uh, tell us to do. So sometimes you'll see um, uh, NSD, sometimes NID, it's the same thing. Now for the same two vibrations, we can uh, compare the durations, T2 minus T1 divided by the, norm, by the sum. And in this case, if the vibrations have the same duration, the normalized time difference is zero. Now this is the, a large data set collected by Arash and Athena uh, where uh, in, in all these experiments the normalized time difference was zero. The duration was 400 millisecond. And these are the results from uh, a large set of rats, a set of humans. And you can see uh, nicely shaped psychometric curves with a uh, steep uh, shape. In general, on average, the human subjects are better than the rats, but there's some variability between subjects. In fact, uh, the, the most proficient rat uh, performs as well as a, a, a less proficient human. So humans are on average better than rats, but rats are quite good. Now you'll notice that an ideal observer does not have a perfect step function psychometric curve, and that's because the vibrations are stochastic. So sometimes the the actual uh, speed that is produced by a vibration does not match the uh, dis distribution from which uh, those speed values were, were sampled. So um, now I want to come into sort of the, the, the dimension that is critical in, this, in, in the rest of the entire uh, presentation, which is time. What, do, what does time mean in this experiment? Well, we produce the vibration by sampling um, velocity values from a, from a normal distribution. We refer to them as speed, but the 
actual physical value is, is velocity. And so um, as we, uh, and the task of the subject is to sort of find some kind of an average of this, uh, of the vibration. That's what the reward rule is based on. It's based on the average uh, speed of the two different vibrations, the mean speeds. So um, for this form of vibration, differently from a sinusoid, for this form of, of uh, vibration, there's actually more information presented as the stimulus continues in time. So, uh, for instance, um, this is a, a distribution in red of velocity values, and the distribution is sampled uh, for about 40 milliseconds. This is the vibration that has occurred in those 40 milliseconds. But if you're an observer of the vibration and you have to make an estimate of what distribution these samples come from, you would not have a very good estimate because these bars, which are the actual sample values, do not really tell you very much about the normal distribution. However, um, I'll run the, the video and you'll see the vibration develop in time. Oops. And you see that as the vibration continues over time, the sample values come to resemble more and more and more and more the distribution from which they're drawn. So that tells us, just by statistics, without any kind of neuroscience, just by the, the logic of statistics, it tells us that if we give a vibration for a longer period of time, we would expect performance to improve because uh, as a vibration lasts longer, uh, any subject uh, has more information about the statistical properties of the vibration, about the mean speed. So that's exactly what we did uh, in this uh, Arash uh, uh, experiment. Um, we consider the first vibration for, I won't show you all the data, but in this, in this particular data set, the first vibration has a duration of 400 milliseconds, and the second vibration has a duration of either 200 or 400 or 600. So what is our prediction? Our prediction is that if we make three different psychometric curves for these three different instances, the psychometric curves will be progressively steeper or sharper because uh, as the second vibration increases in duration, the subject has a better um, uh, quantity, a better um, um, statistical sample from wh with which to compare the first vibration. So the curves should get progressively better. These are the data, the observed data in a set of rats. And we do in fact see that as the vibration, second vibration increases in duration, the psychometric curve is progressively steeper. So that's very nice. It suggests, it, it, it confirms or that as you would expect, when the vibration lasts longer, the rat has a, a better signal with which to estimate the intensity of the vibration and does the task better. But the main phenomenon seen in these psychometric curves is not just the slope, but actually a leftward shift of the curves. So what does this leftward shift mean? It means that a longer vibration is actually judged as stronger, and a shorter vibration, the dark blue one, is judged as weaker. In other words, uh, for any given uh, difference in mean speeds, we can take a difference of zero, which means that the two vibrations have the same intensity or the same mean speed. If we make the second vibration progressively longer, the likelihood that that vibration is judged as stronger increases. So this was a surprise to us. The longer vibration feels stronger and the shorter one feels weaker. It was a surprise because uh, if you consider the brain as an ideal observer, a longer vibration should be judged better, but it should not be judged as stronger. There's nothing stronger in reality, in physical, uh, in physical terms, there's nothing stronger about a long vibration. So we decided to, uh, to analyze this problem, really just throw a lot of effort, a lot of energy into this problem, uh, and a few years of work resulted in, in another um, publication, which is, uh, came out just uh, a month, month or so ago, uh, with PhD student Alessandro Tozo, again at Ash, uh, Luciano Paz, who's a postdoc, and Francesca Pulecki, who's uh, uh, very, very deeply involved in animal training in our laboratory. And um, in this paper, we um, 
explored um, very thoroughly this relationship between the duration of the vibration and the perceived intensity. So shown here for humans and for rats is the psychometric curve uh, for many, 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 many thousands of trials uh, uh, where the stimulus difference, the speed difference or intensity difference is shown in this axis. And the probability of judging the second as stronger than the first is shown in this axis. So you see very nice psychometric curves. In this, in the two green curves, the data are not, uh, are not separated according to the um, duration difference. If we separate the data according to the duration difference, then we can confirm the earlier result, namely when the time difference is positive, that is when the second vibration lasts longer than the first, in light blue, for rats and humans, the second vibration is judged as stronger. And when the second vibration lasts less, has lower duration than the first, it's judged as weaker. So again, the stronger, the longer vibration feels stronger and the shorter vibration feels weaker. So this is a very, a very uh, strong confirmation of the earlier result with a different set of rats, a different set of humans, uh, and, but, but the same result. Now, in the intensity task, what we've shown is that the duration is an irrelevant feature. Ideally, the brain would not even use duration, um, and yet it influences the choices. Now, we can introduce a new task where we use exactly the same stimulus set, and I think that's what's very elegant and very beautiful about these studies, is that we use exactly the same stimuli, but we simply train the rats to extract a different feature. Uh, the durations of the two stimuli. So now it's called the duration task, and the subject uh, is supposed to compare, is, is uh, trained to compare T2 versus T1. In this case, T2 is greater than T1, and now the feature that was had to be extracted in the first task, the intensity of two stimuli, is now the irrelevant feature. Because if you consider absolute time, uh, uh, the duration of a stimulus, how strong that stimulus is makes no difference in time. So uh, an ideal performer measures duration with no influence of the irrelevant feature uh, intensity. So this was the, um, the previous uh, duration effect on intensity. And here we see a sort of a symmetrical intensity effect on duration. So now this is the time difference between the two stimuli. This is the likelihood or probability of judging the second stimulus as longer than the first stimulus. And we see very, very nice psychometric curves, both in humans and in rats. But we see a bias produced by the irrelevant feature. That is, when the second stimulus is stronger, it feels longer. It feels like more time has passed uh, during that stimulus. Uh, than when the second stimulus is uh, is weak, than when uh, the stimulus is weaker. Stronger feels longer and weaker feels shorter. So comparing two stimuli might be a special case. The stimulus has to go into memory, it has to be uh, uh, retrieved from memory. Maybe this confusion between duration and intensity and between intensity and duration occurs because it's a memory task. So we ask uh, human subjects to judge a single stimulus. Uh, removing memory from, from the equation. So the subject receives uh, one stimulus. The stimulus is characterized by its duration, T, by its intensity, uh, in, shown by this uh, mean speed, and has to indicate by moving their mouse along a bar whether they uh, judge the stimulus as being strong in intensity, uh, according to this red bar, or long in duration, according to the blue bar. So, of course, we have to normalize the, this, this judgment scale uh, across different subjects. But once we've normalized it, uh, we have this um, normalized scale. And what we see is exactly the same effect. Namely, when subjects judge intensity, the, this is the intensity scale. As they judge intensity, then as the actual physical intensity increases, the uh, perceived intensity increases as given by the positive slope. Well, that makes sense. Uh, we'd be very worried if, if that were not the case. But 
the confound, the bias is that when the set, when the judge stimulus lasts longer, it's also judged as stronger. So uh, it's it's exactly the same uh, result found in the memory task, but now it's a single stimulus, and we find exactly the same effect in the duration uh, task. Uh, subjects judge the uh, duration of a single stimulus, and as one would hope, um, when the actual duration increases, the perceived duration increases, but the perceived duration increases also when the intensity increases. So once again, in a different experimental paradigm, longer feels stronger, shorter feels weaker, and stronger feels longer, weaker feels shorter. Uh, so when we process uh, uh, a vibration, do we extract it? Okay, so um, I, I think I was here. Um, when we uh, process a vibration, do we extract intensity or duration, as in Model 1, where we have a stimulus, a tactile drive. This is our percept, and the percept may be of intensity or duration according to what we're trained to do or what we're asked to do. Or alternatively, do we extract intensity and duration, producing simultaneously two different percepts? And according to the instructions of the training, we sort of sample or probe this percept or this percept and then give our, give our choice. So to answer that, um, it, it's uh, much more convenient to, to test this in humans than in rats. And what we did is a simple experiment in which we, we instruct the subject as to which percept will be, um, will be asked to judge either before the stimulus occurs or after the stimulus occurs. So in the first case, um, they are told on this specific trial, exactly right now, you're going to get a stimulus. And from this stimulus, you have to uh, report the, the duration or, you have to or, or in another trial, they're told to report the intensity. In this um, case, they receive the vibration and they don't know which one they're going to have to report. And then they get a cue that says, uh, uh, give us the intensity or give us the duration. According to model one, the performance would be very poor in this case compared to in the cue after compared to cue before, because in the cue after the subject doesn't know which percept to produce uh, because they're not, they don't have the instructions yet. And um, whereas in this model, the performance would be the same in the two cases. And these are the results in duration estimation the uh, sub human subjects estimate duration is exactly the same whether they receive the cue after the cue before. And the uh, subjects duration estimation is the same whether they receive the cue uh, after or the cue before, the cue about which feature to extract. Therefore, um, what the brain seems to be doing, the human brain, and we imagine it's also occurring in the rat brain, is the tactile drive is simultaneously leading to two percepts and the task is simply to um, report one, one or the other. So um, what I've said uh, up to now is that perceived duration grows with time, as it should, it has to, otherwise it, we couldn't call it duration perception. But unexpectedly it also uh, grows with vibration speed. And I've also shown you that perceived intensity grows with vibration speed, as it should, but also grows with uh, stimulus duration. So how can this occur? And since you're all, all of you are computational neuroscientists, and you probably already have a model for what kind of a function uh, can explain some quantity that grows with input amplitude and it also grows with time. Uh, the, that family of function, which is commonly used in, in computational neuroscience, is a leaky integrator. It has the property that it grows with time and grows with am input amplitude. What a leaky integrator looks like is uh, nothing other than, in fact, a leaky integrator. Um, it's, you can imagine a leaky integrator as being a bathtub. It has an input and it has an output. The output is called a leak. And the main features that characterize the leak integrator are the strength of the input and how quickly the water leaks out, the rate of leakage. 
And what one is interested in the leak integrator is this value, is how much water has accumulated, this gamma. So we can, uh, uh, we can formulate leak integration as um, the change in, in the water level, the change in gamma over time is multiplied by some constant, is equal to what comes in minus what comes out. So what comes in is the sensory drive, and what comes out is the leakage. The sensory drive, in our case, is a function of intensity, which is a stronger vibration, and it's a time function. And so, uh, so this this uh, uh, quantity gamma is is the percept. So what we want to do is to try to explain the the percept, um, the perceived intensity or, or the perceived duration, according to the formulation as a leaky integrator. Okay, and and you can see why it would make sense for the two models uh, for the two. Uh, perceptual functions that we've talked about so far. For intensity, keep in mind that tau is the leak rate and uh, gamma, sorry, gamma is the leak rate and tau is a time constant which is the constant C divided by uh, lambda. And if, um, if tau is very short, then we would have, uh, in principle, a, an intensity percept because with, when tau is, is very short, that means the leakage is very high, and the intensity percept in that case would rapidly grow, but then it would reach a steady state because what leaks out is the same as what leaks in. So that's a steady state, a stable value. On the other hand, a duration percept could be produced if tau is very long. Tau is very long if the leakage is very low, and what that essentially means is that uh, very little is coming out of the bathtub, and so the, the depth of the water increases over time. And that's exactly what a duration percept should do. It should uh, accumulate in almost a linear way, which, as I say, can be produced with a long time constant, which means with very low leakage. So our hypothesis is, which I'll explore in the next few experiments, is that the sensory cortex uh, where the whisker input is, is represented in the brain of the rat is the drive to a leaky integrator. And the leaky integrator is downstream. Now, to be more precise, we're actually saying there are two leak integrators, right? Because we're saying that simultaneously the brain is producing intensity and duration. So the drive from sensory cortex goes to downstream, in fact, to two locations. Sensory cortex itself does not do any accumulation. The neurons in sensory cortex act like filters so that they're influenced by the last 10 or 20 or 30 milliseconds of the vibration. Uh, but what happens earlier than 20 or 30 milliseconds ago has no effect on the firing of the neuron. The neurons don't have any memory functions. They don't have any integrative functions. They don't have accumulation functions. They receive a vibration. They convert the vibration into a spike train where each spike is related to the most recent event in the vibration. This spike train, this, this is a real spike train, of course, of a, of a neuron from um, sensory cortex while the rat receives the vibration. These spike trains are uh, envisioned as uh, being transmitted to integrators downstream, which we uh, have reason to believe are in the frontal cortex. So to test this, uh, the plausibility of this uh, model uh, in the uh, uh, post-computational biology paper that I referred to before, we take the spike trains that are recorded from the sensory cortex of, of rats as they receive the vibration. This is the spike train of a, a number of neurons. The, as the vibration uh, speed increases, the firing rate increases. We can consider the neurons as coding neurons, which are ones that are influenced uh, they encode the speed of the vibration, non-coding neurons. We integrate these spike trains with different time constants, <clears throat> um, and we can find a combination of uh, free parameters, which include the time constant tau, 
the, the number of coding neurons versus non-coding neurons, and we can integrate these coding and non-coding neurons with a time constant to produce a neurometric curve that is exactly the same as the psychometric curve. The psychometric curve is the actual behavior of the rat, and the neurometric curve is a behavior that you would predict according to the model for integration. So we take the neural activity, we integrate the neural activity. When it's integrated over time with a long time constant, this gamma function increases over time. From this final value at the end of the stimulus, we take this to be the perceived duration. And then we simply say, uh, for the two vibrations, which one is perceived as longer? That gives us a, 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 a behavioral choice according to neural activity, and we see that it reproduces the actual uh, behavioral choices of the rats. Now, if we include more coding neurons and fewer non-coding neurons, we integrate with a short time constant, then we get a neurometric function that looks like the psychometric function for intensity. So the bottom line is that the plausibility of the model is good. It makes sense. Uh, we show that we could have a representation in sensory cortex that could be integrated in such a way as to uh, perfectly explain the behavior of the rats. So the reconstruction of psychometric curves through the so-called neurometric curve shows the plausibility of sensory cortex as the source of drive to downstream integrators. But we uh, want to have a more direct proof because there could be many parts of the brain that are integrated in order to produce a, a duration perceptor, an intensity percept. How do we know that, uh, that the activity in sensory cortex is, is really what the, the rat is using to produce this percept? So for a direct proof, uh, with Sebastian uh, Reinhardt, who was a postdoc with me and is now uh, in, at uh, University of Basel in Switzerland. And again, this guy keeps coming back, Arash Fasihi. And we introduced optogenetics, uh, where the um, uh, light was delivered into the brain and simultaneously neuronal activity was recorded. Um, this shows the um, uh, the virus injection in, in a rat. This is a device built by um, uh, the Mechatronics Lab at CISA, which is now a, a startup company called Synexo. And this is a very, very set which allows the investigators to move the, uh, the, uh, um, the optic fiber and the electrodes in the brain to find the relevant neural population. This is um, a virus-infected uh, cortex, sensory cortex of a rat. And this, these are just some example neurons to show that um, uh, according to which virus we, we, we inject, we can either control neuronal excitability by blue light or neuronal inhibition by red light. So this is optogenetic excitation, and this is optogenetic inhibition. Uh, so we can um, modulate or influence or uh, steer or control or command the representation, the firing um, uh, of the vibration in sensory cortex through optogenetics. And this is the result of the experiment um, in a duration rat, uh, sorry, in a set of duration rats. Now, the rat has to compare the, the second duration to the first duration. And if we excite the sensory cortex during the second stimulus, the duration of that stimulus is overestimated. So we add spikes to the sensory representation of the vibration, and the rat thinks that the vibration is lasting longer. If we add spikes, uh, through excitation, optogenetic excitation, to the first vibration, then the first vibration is judged as lasting longer. So we can make, we can um, influence the rat's sense of time directly through the tactile cortex, through the whisker cortex. With inhibition, we find um, uh, the parallel result. If we inhibit neuronal firing during the second stimulus, 
that stimulus is judged as lasting less time. And if we inhibit firing during the first stimulus, then the first stimulus is judged as lasting uh, uh, less time. Uh, the, you can see that the red and green are reversed uh, for the in case of inhibition versus uh, excitation. Now, as a control, we can use the same uh, light stimulation, but present it to the whole rat instead of to the brain, and there's no effect. So that, that tells us that in this case, uh, when we see the optogenetic effect, it's not because the rat sees the blue light, it's because the blue light uh, excites neurons. Now, if we uh, put the different conditions together, we see that under the no light condition, the duration rats have a very nice uh, psychometric curve. That is, they can judge the duration difference between the first and second vibration, shown by the black point data points and the curve fitting in, in as a line. Uh, if we excite a sensory cortex during the second stimulus, the time the occupied rat that stimulus seems to expand. If we suppress uh, activity in sensory cortex during the sensory stimulus, that stimulus seems to occupy less time. And now the model says that there's tactile drive to two integrators, right? And up to now I was talking about, I, I think I showed, I hope I showed that the tactile drive through sensory cortex uh, is integrated to produce a duration percept because we can directly, uh, we can uh, directly add or, or subtract spikes from the tactile drive through sensory cortex and the duration percept is altered. But we've also argued that there's, in parallel, the generation of intensity percept. So in intensity rats, we do the same experiment and find that, just as you'd expect, it's not a, it's not a, a big surprise, that we can affect the perceived dura uh, intensity in intensity rats through optogenetics. So let me see what the time is. OK, almost out of time. Okay, so we have, uh, in short, we have compression and dilation of time through sensory cortex. So if we imagine the rat's perceived duration as a stopwatch, um, a 334 millisecond stimulus is perceived uh, uh, veridically as 334 milliseconds if there's no optogenetics, but we can expand that, the sense of time by, on average, 39 milliseconds through excitation, or we can compress it by 18 milliseconds by inhibition. So we have essentially um, the, we've shown that the sensory cortex is part of the rat's overall clock. Now this uh, puts us in the field of neuronal basis of time perception, which is a very crowded field, uh, which includes uh, um, reports of the involvement of hippocampus, premotor cortex, parietal cortex, and so on and so forth. Particularly important in the last few years has been um, uh, contributions, reports of the involvement of the striatum in duration judgments. So in this experiment from uh, Patton's lab, there's an interval between two events, which typically are two acoustic signals, um, and the rat has to judge the time that passes between the two signals as being large or small compared to some imaginary boundary. Uh, and this is the um, uh, psychometric curve in green. When they put muscimol in the striatum, the performance decreases, uh, which is, is sort of a first order evidence that the striatum is involved in this task. And the reason that uh, the, the neuronal basis of the striatal involvement is many neurons which um, increase or decrease their firing rate, they're called ramping neurons, in time during the task. So this is all of the ramping neurons in, in the patent study where they're aligned according to the peak of their firing rate. And you can see that different neurons peak at different times. And intuitively, you can see how this could lead to a very solid, reliable representation of time. And in fact, they can decode time. They can produce a neurometric uh, function for time perception from this firing. This is decoded time on this axis, real time. And you can see that a decoder, a Bayesian population decoder, can, can very accurately decode the, the real time according to this um, population in the striatum. 
can we reproduce these striatal results in our own behavioral par paradigm? And this ex these experiments were done by Alessandro Toso and Sebastian Reinhardt. But we go, in instead of a single uh, empty time interval, we again do a comparison task. The subject has to compare the duration of the first versus the second stimulus. We record neuronal activity in exactly the same region of the striatum. And the uh, distinction from the patent studies are two principal things. First of all, the our rats are not judging a single stimulus, but are comparing two different stimuli. That's important because if a, if a single duration is judged, then the judgment and the preparation of the action and the decision are all taking place at the same time as the stimulus itself. That makes, that opens up the possibility that the neuronal representation might be a representation of the action rather than a representation of the uh, perceived time itself. The second difference is that in our experiment, the judgment is made of an actual sensory event, uh, a, a, a vibration, rather than the empty time between two different intervals, two different events. And in our data, just as in the um, uh, other striatal data, and the time can be decoded. So it's the same Bayesian population decoder of uh, elapsed time from striatal population, and the data look the same. However, this is extremely important, the time representation in the striatum is not confounded by vibration intensity. So when we decode time of, uh, uh, of elapsed time of a vibration, the intensity of the vibration, shown by the different colors, does not affect the time that's encoded in the striatum. This argues that it's not the substrate for the perceived time, because perceived time is affected by stimulus intensity. I've shown one after another after another experiment that says perceived time is affected by stimulus intensity, but the striatal population is not affected by stimulus intensity. So that was the first um, suggestion that there may be some issue with, um, uh, with the striatum as the substrate of perceived time. We continued uh, with other analyses. Time intervals that are unrelated to the perceptual task are encoded equally as well. The pre-stimulus delay, the inter-stimulus delay, the post-stimulus delay, all of these are encoded in the striatum, not just the stimulus that has to be judged. Furthermore, when the rat misjudges time, that is the error trials, the time representation in the striatum is no less precise than on the correct trials. So that again argues that this is not the representation that the rat is using in order to make a judgment of time. If it were using this judgment, uh, this, this population, then on error trials the um, uh, output would be less precise. And as a final index, we measure time coding in the striatum uh, in rats that are actually doing the, the intensity task. So keep in mind that for the intensity delayed comparison, the duration of the stimulus is the irrelevant feature. It's the feature that should be discarded from the percept or not used or not uh, affecting um, uh, the output. And yet the, in the intensity rats, the duration of the stimulus is encoded in the striatum uh, not perfectly as well, but almost as well as in, in the duration rats. So the irrelevant, um, so, so when duration is irrelevant to the task itself, the striatum encodes time uh, in the same way as it does when, when the duration is the relevant feature. So, um, we, we uh, began to suspect that the striatum is not the basis of the, of the t time percent in this experimental paradigm. Is sensory cortical drive accumulated to produce a percept of duration through sensory cortex, as we've uh, argued, or is the substrate elsewhere? So the key differences in those studies are that uh, Patton's uh, laboratory used empty time. There's no stimulus between the two events. And secondly, that the, judge, that the judgment is made as the stimulus occurs. And so decision-making and action preparation overlap uh, time perception. So we, we continued this analysis with 
Sebastian and Maria. And Maria gave the, the presentation this morning. And I'll just take a few slides from her presentation. And I apologize if it's redundant, but it, it fits perfectly in, into my own presentation. Uh, so um, again, we, we um, give a single stimulus now. Matthew. The, the, I'm out of time. Yes, I want to mention, because we want to have a few minutes for questions and answers, uh, uh, just uh, yeah, if, you, if you can summarize it. Okay. You... okay, I'll summarize it. And when we, um, as I can summarize it even faster because Maria already presented the experiment. So when, when the stimulus has a very sharp onset and offset, uh, then the uh, intensity um, bias disappears. This is intensity bias that you're familiar with now. The stronger stimulus is judged as longer. But uh, when there's a strong onset or offset pulse, the intensity of the vibration within between the two pulses no longer affects perception, uh, duration perception. And the same result occurs in humans. And so the optogenetic bias uh, can be reproduced when the subject is judging a continuous a uniform vibration, but the optogenetic bias disappears when the vibration has a strong onset and offset. Uh, and, and this is the quantification of that effect. So the answer is that there are many different ways uh, that the, there appear to be different ways in which the brain can produce a sense of time. And the way that it, the brain produces a sense of time depends a lot on what is the actual event that has to be judged. So to summarize, and this is the, the end, and I've shown that, there's, that the main feature is flexibility in neural, neural algorithms. Uh, I suggested that a tactile drive, which comes directly through sensory cortex, produces an intensity percept when it's accumulated or integrated, produces a duration percept according to the time constant of integration. When we look in more detail at the duration percept, we find that there's in fact one pathway where the vibration itself is integrated to produce a percept, but another pathway available to the brain when there's a sharp onset and offset, uh, which bypasses the sensory drive as the accumulation and something, maybe the striatum or maybe somewhere else, is, is accumulated, but not the vibration itself. So thank you for your attention. Um, and those who give support to Laboratory Human Frontiers, principally also ERC, and uh, the technical support laboratory, Francesca I mentioned before, and these guys uh, build the equipment. And this is just to end from outside in 2004. One or two of you might have been there that evening. Thank you. I'm done. Safura uh, Rashid Shomali says, what is the role of adaptation in longer duration of presentation? That's a very, 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 very good question. Um, and we, we, we think that the adaptation is essentially uh, what's happening in the tactile drive. And, uh, and the adapted sensory cortical signal is what is accumulated. So in, in the simulations, when, when I show you, for instance, in this experiment, do you still see my slides? Yes, you know? Yes, we see it. Yes, we can. Okay. okay. So look at this. This is adaptation. Thank you very much for this question. This is encoding neurons. This is adaptation. And we integrate the, the drive that comes from sensory cortex, and that drive includes the adaptation. So it's kind of built into the it's built into the model, and when when neurons adapt, the model um, uh, integrates that adapted signal. Matthew, okay. I want to ask a very quick question just to make sure that I understood the task. So in the in the they yeah. do the intensity judgment. I don't hear you anymore. Can you hear me? Yes, now I hear you. So in the rats that, I just want to make sure that I understand the paradigm. So in the rats that do, uh, let's say, intensity judgment, uh, do, uh, do you keep the, the duration of both the stimuli the same and you only change the intensity? And vice versa for the rats that are judging the duration, you keep the intensity the same, only change the duration? Or is it just a random mix of both parameters? Uh, the rat has it's to know. It's a mix of both parameters. 
It's a mix of both parameters, and that's how we that's how we uncover the bias. And for instance, in the in the intensity, the rat may have to compare the intensity of two vibrations that are characterized by mean speed of let's say forty versus sixty in speed, but the durations also differ, and it's the effect of the duration on the perceived intensity that that uncovers this bias, the, the effect of the irrelevant feature. Uh, likewise, when rats have to compare two durations, the intensity of the two stimuli, stimuli might be the same, but also might be different. And by changing the intensities of the two vibrations, we discover the role of intensity in perceived duration. So the answer is that it's a mixture, it's a matrix, but not, I wouldn't say a random mixture, yeah, it's it's a well controlled matrix of let's say ten by ten. I see. And these are two different groups of rats, or each rat can can do both contexts. Basically. No, no. Each each rat it's it's uh, each rat gets all the stimuli. So, um, so maybe I think I. Would. How does the rat know in which context? Okay, here's okay. Here's um, I I hope you can see this now. Yes. So this is uh, the the stimulus matrix. So there are. Um, uh, a hundred different <clears throat> stimuli here, I think. A uh, hundred different, um, yeah, stimulus values, where um, a stimulus can be um, can have any possible. A given vibration can have any possible uh, duration and any possible um, uh, intensity. And then, when there are two stimuli, then you have uh, you have you have uh, uh, both stimuli with with each of these possible values. Then you said, how does the rat know? I didn't hear the end of the sentence. I just wanted to know how does the rat know if he is in the uh, duration context or intensity context. Okay. So the, the rats are, are very different from the humans because in the humans we just say, um, uh, for these two vibrations, report which one is stronger. Or, or we can say which one, which one is, is longer. Uh, for the rats, we have not yet even tried that. Um, I, I think we could... We could do it, but we haven't tried it yet. Uh, and so, uh, let me make this point very clear, carefully, uh, very clearly. We have intensity rats and we have duration rats. And the rat is trained on what to do to extract one feature and to ignore the other feature. So there's no, none of our rats uh, extract one or the other. Every rat extracts just one feature. I see. And, and one last quick question. So if if what the human and rat is reporting is just the leak integration of the sensory information, then, yeah. um, I, I mean, if, if it's the same parameters in both tasks, then uh, duration and, and, and amplitude will be completely confounded. But you show that basically there's an effect of duration on intensity and intensity block and vice versa, but it's not, it's not yes. the case that it's completely, I mean, they're just, just basically making uh, some of the squares uh, of the power of the yes. signal over some time. So uh, I'm wondering how does that um, is how is that reflected in the model? It, it feels to me like that maybe humans and rats are doing an imperfect job of reporting time and intensity based on some uh, as uh, based on some um, you know uh, leak integrator. Maybe maybe if there were a case that the stakes were high, uh, they could really uh, use a different method uh, uh, to 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 give you time. Or intensity. Right now, they're using a method that that that, that is prone to errors. Yeah, the um, those are very interest, important, pro and provocative uh, questions. So um, it's true that if there were a, one leak integrator, uh, that leak integrator could produce one gamma or one percept, and that and that percept would be a reasonably good reflection of intensity because the, that the value, the integrated value, would increase with intensity, and it would also be reasonably good um, um, correlate of duration because the value would increase with with, with duration. Uh, but we we've uh, shown very very carefully that in fact um, when th that these two percepts are different. Um, I where are the data I have all, all the data, so we can. Okay, so, so this is, for instance, um, if we take intensity rats and, uh, sorry, intensity humans, intensity rats, uh, 
and we say uh, when they're doing uh, duration, if we take their judgments and we uh, estimate the correctness of their choices according to the actual durations of the stimuli, this is how well they perform. But if we take their judgments and we uh, consider their choices according to the actual intensities of the stimuli, this is how well they perform. So uh, when they're doing the duration task, their choices are much more affected by the actual duration than the intensity. When people do the intensity task, the choices are much more affected by the stimulus intensity than by the stimulus duration. But both of these values, this red bar here and this blue bar here, are above 50%. And these positive values are the biases. So this is how much uh, intensity affects the duration judgment, and this is how much duration affects the intensity judgment. And the same, the same effect is found in rats. So this analysis shows that they have two discrete percepts and they, they report one percept or the other percept. Now, how that can occur is by these, uh, by these uh, dual leak integrators, okay? Now, since the input to the two integrators is a common, then there's going to be some confusion. There's going to be a confound because uh, a drive, a strong drive will infect, affect intensity, but a strong drive will also affect duration. Uh, and, and a long drive will affect duration as it should, but the long drive also affects uh, intensity. And this un, un, unwanted effect is, is the bias. Um, can they learn not to do it? No, we've never been able to. We trained rats for six, eight months, ten months, and they never can learn to ignore the irrelevant feature, and neither can humans. But there is a mechanism that ignores the irrelevant feature, which is to have the flanked stimulus. Okay, because when you have the flanked stimulus, when you have the flanked stimulus, as Maria showed you this morning, when you have the flanked stimulus, what happens on the between the two flanks does not go into the integrator. So then you have, in a way, an unbiased measurement of duration. But the problem is that most things that happen in the natural world, most things that you judge, do not have strong onset and offset signals. So in many circumstances, you have to judge things um, where it's the sensory drive itself that provides the, the relevant information. Thank you for the question. Thank you very much, Dr. Diamond, again. It was a great talk. Thank you. Uh, we have